Hello again and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about crystals. These are a couple of very old ones that I had from my childhood. I'm sure most of you are aware that crystals resonate at a particular frequency. This one is marked 3.601 kilocycles. The other one is marked 3.920 kilocycles. This is the 34th edition of the Radio Amateur's Handbook. You can see this was published in 1957. It has this whole section here on crystals. If you're unfamiliar with how they work, I recommend you get a book like this. There's probably a lot of this information is posted on the internet as well. There's various things that will affect the resonant frequency of a crystal. Obviously the mechanics of the crystal itself, how it was cut, the thickness and whatnot. But a few other things affect it, like temperature for example. Another thing that will affect it is the loading capacitance. So if you're trying to trim a crystal, one of the common practices is to place a small capacitor in parallel with the crystal. And then you can just trim that and that will actually change the resonant point. But there's another thing that we can change and what I'd like to do is take this thing apart and show you how this is made. And then we can go over that. These crystals all look the same inside. We'll just take this one apart in here. As you can see we have these two copper plates. These connect to these two steel plates. And you can see these are proud in all four corners. In between these is our piece of quartz. So that quartz is suspended between those eight prongs. So this is allowed to vibrate between these two plates. These copper plates make contact with the steel plates. And you can see there's this insulating material. And then we have a mechanical spring that basically pushes this whole assembly together. Back when I had an amateur radio license, the novice class wasn't allowed to use a VFO or a variable frequency oscillator. Everything had to be crystal controlled. So it was common for novices to have several of these crystals, depending on what frequency that they wanted to operate on. A lot of times you could find crystals that were cheap, that were lower than the frequency of the band that you wanted to operate. So what you could do is take these crystals apart and you'd take a sheet of glass with some grinding compound and you literally could sit there and just polish that quartz and thin it up and raise the frequency. So besides using these for your crystal oscillator, another common usage is for audio. So a lot of you are familiar with the piezo buzzer, what it looks like. Basically you're driving that with a high voltage AC sine wave and you run the frequency right at the resonant point of that beeper. And those can be quite loud, they're quite efficient. So that got me thinking is, could we take a crystal like this and apply a high voltage to it and cause that to flex? And what I was thinking by that is, you can imagine if I've got a crystal that's flat and as I put a DC voltage across it and I bend it, the resonant point will probably change as we put that stress on there. Now, of course, at some point, we could probably actually cause the crystal to crack. But I'm thinking if we ran it at low enough voltages, we could actually see that shift. So think about it in terms of a guitar string. As we place that guitar string under more tension, the resonant frequency of it goes up. So that's how you tune the guitar. So I think that that's probably what's going to happen with these crystals is we apply that voltage and we start to bend that crystal it's going to change the resonant frequency. Now, I've shown in the past how I used the Nano VNA to test crystals. And I went over this fixture here, so this is nothing more than a couple of 3 dB pads, I believe. And then I've got a couple of matching transformers that allow me to translate the 50 ohms to something more closer to what the crystal is. I can't use this fixture because what I want to do again is apply a high voltage across this crystal and we don't want to damage our VNA. So to run this test it will require a different fixture. So this is the fixture that I'm going to be using today. This is bi-directional but we can call this P0 of the VNA and this would be P1. I have a couple of blocking capacitors. Of course I have the crystal that I want to test and then I'm going to have two resistors They'll be in series with each leg of the crystal, and these will go back to a high voltage power supply. The resistance on these is going to be 3.6 K ohms, and I'm going to be using a 1000 picofarad capacity for each one of these. The crystal I'm going to be using is 3.7 megahertz, so if we calculate the impedance for our capacitors, it's roughly 43 ohms. So this is looking at our fixture. Again, this will connect to the VNA. One side being port zero, 
that will go to one of the blocking capacitor. These capacitors are ceramic type. You can see it's 1000 picofarads plus minus 10% and these are rated for 5 kilovolts DC. These two capacitors are identical. You can see they brought up to a couple of test points. Then we have our two series resistors so we'll be applying the high voltage directly across these two leads here. One of the common questions I get asked is if my software will work with the H4. Now I purchased one of these quite some time ago tried to replicate a problem that another person was having with theirs. Unfortunately what I ran into is that the firmware for this was never good enough to use with my software. Now that's changed over the past year so I was able to actually find a version of the firmware that would pass my regression test so we're going to be using this VNA to conduct these tests today. Actually, I think this is the first time that I've ever actually legitimately used this thing. So I'll go ahead and get that thing set up. Alright, so here's our setup. Off to the left, this is our ESD gun. Again, this is the output voltage in kilovolts. These leads are attached to the output of this. And we'll be connecting these right to our test fixture here. Again, this is connected directly up to our H4 VNA. Again, we use the original Nano VNA software for this. And we just select our defaults. And we can go ahead and select Link. And let's select Sweep. And we'll change our start frequency to a meg. And we'll change the stop frequency to 5 meg. And because we're looking at the transmission or S21, we'll go ahead and select transmission rectangular and right here we can see the resonant point of the crystal and again this is right around 3.71 megahertz or so we can zoom into this a little bit we'll select a center frequency at 3.7 and let's change our span to 1 megahertz and go ahead and tighten that up a little bit further let's change it to 100 kilohertz off the main menu we can select advanced and you can see it defaults to the crystal parameters. This center graph is looking at the resonant frequency for this particular crystal. And you can see it's fairly stable. If I put this thing into maybe a little chamber and control the temperature, this thing would get a lot flatter than what it is now, or we just let it sit here and stabilize. Again, as you handle this thing, it's going to affect the temperature of the crystal. It's one of the problems that I ran into when I was testing them to build those crystal filters is I was touching the parts to put them into the jig and just having my hands touch the crystal, it caused enough of a temperature shift I had to have to wait for the temperature to become stable again where I could actually make the measurement. So I'm going to go ahead and connect our high voltage leads across the jig. And now I'm going to slowly start to increase the voltage. And let's just see if we see any change in the frequency. Oh. Let's try going back the other way. Huh. Let's try inverting the two leads. I don't think this would make a difference, but we are bending the crystal in the other direction. Let's see what happens. And sure enough, you can see the frequency is going upwards now and let's start dropping it back down ah. we're not changing a lot you can see the total shift here is less than about 20 Hertz but it definitely has an effect on it but also notice that the voltage I'm running this up to I mean, that's like 400 volts there. And that's a thousand volt.
Let's try going a little higher. Oh. <laughs> Did we just kill our VNA? We might have. Yep, that may be the end of the VNA right there. So let's see if we can recover from this. <laughs> Go ahead and turn it off. Turn it back on. Does it come back? Ooh. All right, let's go back to the main page here. And we'll relink to it. And we'll select sweep. Oh, you can see right there. Sure enough, <laughs> we didn't kill it. I'm actually quite surprised. <laughs> um, let's go back to our resonant frequency. Let's try tuning this in a little tighter. What we can do is select the zoom function here. And now we'll select the advanced. Let's just clear this out real quick. Let's try it again. Maybe we won't take it up to quite that high a voltage. <laughs> I think we're pushing our luck. It's one of the nice things about these VNAs. Again, I don't remember what I paid for this, but it was under $100. So I would never conduct a test like this on that Agilent PNA, for example. You blow the front end of that, and that's going to be a pretty pricey repair. On these things, it's basically disposable. So it's one of the benefits of buying these cheap VNAs is we can run an experiment like this and the risk is pretty low. The worst that's going to happen, we're going to blow the VNA up and we'll buy a new one. You can see this thing, now that it's kind of stabilized, is less than one hertz a shift. And again, let's go ahead and change the supply voltage. Let's see where we first detect this. So there's 200 volts, there's 300. Again, that's only like a one hertz change. There's 600 volts. That's about a six hertz shift. And again, here's one kilovolt. Maybe a 7 hertz shift. And 1.4 kV. And it looks like about an 8 hertz shift. Again, I'll just start bringing the supply back to zero. And you can see the frequency goes right back to normal. <laughs> so yeah, it's an interesting phenomena. I don't think I've ever seen anything published where somebody's tried this probably for good reason you can see where we glitched the H4 already that could have been disastrous right there so there's probably a good reason that people don't run experiments like this with their VNAs <laughs> anyway hope you enjoyed the video we'll see you the next time around later